Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Inner Voice Show. I'm Dr. Fujian Zain and have Sean in studio. This is a show about what matters most in our life, our minds, our thoughts, feelings, actions, relationships, and our fulfillment in this beautiful journey of life. In this show, I'll bring you Dr. Michael Yapko, a clinical psychologist and a marriage and family therapist. He's the author of 15 books where we'll be talking about how to unlock your depression through his latest audiobook and mindset app. Then I will speak to Howard Ross, a lifelong social injustice advocate and the author of multiple books about belongingness and biases. Today, we will be talking about his latest book, Everyday Bias, Identifying and Navigating Unconscious Judgments in Our Daily Lives, Describing How to Bridge the Divide in Our Increasingly Polaroid Society. I love to hear from you, so connect with me through my website, fujon.com, and follow my social media and message me with your comments and topics of interest. I really love to hear from you and I guide this um, show toward what you like best. But first, here's the tip of the week. This week, I've been observing being responsible and accountable in my own life and the life of my clients. We might be used to seeing people, their behaviors, their words, expressions, and make our own judgments or conclusions about them. We also react to their behavior and then hold them responsible for our reactions. It appears that since someone or some event out there has triggered or ignited a particular perception for us and multiple feelings inside of us, then we hold the outside event or different people responsible for triggering us. Um, As if somebody yells and screams, and then we get very, very upset and yell and scream back and like, well, it's their fault, obviously, because if they were yelling, this wouldn't be happening to me. The reality is that we have an option in how we choose to react to the outside event or person. Since many of our thought patterns, emotional expressions, and behavioral reactions have become automatic, it may appear to us that we have no control over our perceptions, feelings, or reactions. I hear all day from my clients that I can't control it. When he comes in and says this to me, I just get so pissed that I have no control and I'm going to yell and scream. Or my boss said this and I could not handle it. I felt so insulted. I couldn't control myself and I was going to do that and it's their fault. So you could see that no matter what, if something happens from outside, if I don't think I can control it, I'm going to hold them responsible. Well, it's not true. It's not true that we have no control. So being responsible for the way we think, feel, and behave creates a sense of inner power, a sense of being in the driver's seat in our life, and the ability to flow with all that shows up. Being accountable for the impact of our actions allows us to learn, shift if necessary, and create results that are better suited for us. And more importantly, we create genuine relationships with integrity. People start trusting us and can rely on us telling them the truth and being real with them. They can trust that we're intentional in our growth and shift the course of our action if it's harmful to ourselves or actually somebody else. The awareness integration approach, which is a model, it's a psychological and an educational model I created, allows us to learn how to be aware and actively be responsible and accountable to ourselves and people around us. You can go through the exercises in my book, Life Reset, to produce this in all areas of your life. Imagine facing the world, people, media, news, um, family members, your loved ones, co-workers, customers, bosses, whomever, whomever you think, or even accidents, any event that happens, with a sense of power and inner peace, knowing that you can choose how to respond at any moment to them in a way that can co-create the best result possible. You are the one who chooses your thoughts and feelings and actions accordingly. In the midst of all the automatic internal processes that to you, it seems like you're out of control. So remember, you are in control and you are powerful. We'll be right back with Dr. Michael Yapka.
Join the conversation every Monday afternoon at 3 p.m. Pacific for Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Dr. Fujian is a radio and TV host, international speaker, psychotherapist, life coach, and the author of Life Reset, The Awareness Path to Create the Life You Want. She brings you the latest research and interviews with experts in the field of cognitive sciences. Anyone who loves to grow and create growth for humanity gets a voice on this call-in show. Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Monday afternoons at 3 p.m. Pacific on Smart Talk, KMET 1490 AM and on KMET 1490 AM dot com. Are you afraid? Are you getting panic attacks? Are you getting bored and can't stand it anymore at your home? Are you finding yourself in a bind with a relationship at home? Are you wondering what the, all of the fuss is? And are you determined to guard yourself against all others? We're worried about how am I going to pay my rent or mortgage? In respect to the coronavirus stress, I'm offering a sliding scale online psychotherapy for anyone in California and life coaching to anyone in the world who's suffering financially. Please connect with me at fujan.com f-o-o-j-a-n.com have you ever wished you could just wake up one day reach across your nightstand and hit the life reset button let's face it the struggles and frustrations of everyday life leave millions of women and men around the globe yearning for a new way and the new way is right here in Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want by Dr. Fujian Zane. You can get it now at fujian.com or amazon.com. Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want. You deserve it. Are you afraid? Are you getting panic attacks? Are you getting bored and can't stand it anymore at your home? Are you finding yourself in a bind with a relationship at home? Are you wondering what the, all of the fuss is? And are you determined to guard yourself against all others? We're worried about how am I going to pay my rent or mortgage? In respect to the coronavirus stress, I'm offering a sliding scale online psychotherapy for anyone in California and life coaching to anyone in the world who's suffering financially. Please connect with me at fujan.com f-o-o-j-a-n.com well welcome back everyone i'm dr fujan zain and i am so excited to be with my teacher my role model i've learned so much so much from this man, Dr. Michael Yapko, he's a clinical psychologist, a marriage and family therapist, is internationally recognized for his work in developing strategic outcome-focused psychotherapies, the advanced clinical applications of hypnosis, and active short-term non-pharmacological treatments of depression. Today, we'll be talking about his latest audiobook, Breaking the Patterns of Depression, and the latest app, Mindset. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Fujian. Always a pleasure to be with you. So I know this book ends and out, and um, I love it, and I'm so glad that it's out now because of the pandemic. The rate of depression and anxiety has uh, skyrocketed. Uh, we see this a lot. Um, we hear about it. I see it in my own practice, and um, it's the best time for it to be out. So can you talk and share a little bit about the book? Sure. Well, your point about the pandemic uh, having a profound effect on people's mental health is absolutely accurate. Uh, you know, with the, the best data that we have suggests that the rates of depression have tripled over the course of the last six months of people reporting depression symptoms. And my book, Breaking the Patterns of Depression, now the audio book, uh, has been a very popular self-help book uh, for many years now. And I think the primary reason for that is because it's so practical. There isn't much psychobabble in there, psychological jargon in there. It's really all about what are realistic perspectives about what it takes to overcome depression. There's a lot that we have learned over the years. Depression's gone from being somewhat of a mystery to something that we understand really well. 
And one of the things that we really understand well is that if anyone's going to recover, it's going to be because they were very actively involved in participating in the treatment process. So the, the fact that we want people to be active in learning new skills, developing new perspectives, is a foundation. And what makes breaking the patterns of depression so practical is that there are well over a hundred different activities, things for people to do. And very specifically, that when we're trying to teach a specific skill, providing a structured exercise for how to do that. So what a reader can expect is that I will first talk about, here's what the skill is, here's why it's such an important skill to have, and now here's a way of developing that skill. So we have a number of exercises that are called learn by doing and others that are called pause and reflect, giving people things to think about to help them develop some new perspectives and new ways of thinking about themselves and their life experience. And then the learn by doings of actually going out there and trying out new behaviors, testing out new perspectives, checking out whether what you think is really true or not and all the kinds of things that invite people to start to redefine themselves and get their lives on track, even more importantly so during a time like this where, where life is chaotic and where there is so much that's uncertain about all of our futures. Uh, one of the most important things that I had learned from you, um, and it took my uh, clinical practice um, effectiveness, efficiency into a whole different level was the way that you teach in how to distinguish between uh, specific thoughts and uh, intentionalities and how we think. I think that um, most of us just think and not necessarily uh, reflect on how are we thinking. And um, you are pretty much the only person that I've seen that really gets in tune about how did you come up with that time kind of thought process uh what how come you chose that type of a thought process so it's not only the thinking but you go behind the thinking and looking at it and one of the aspects about the, also the depression is the way we think that also creates many of these types of um emotions and states afterward can you talk a little bit about this type of a distinction um sure methodology? Well, because I am a writer and a researcher, I stay very current with a variety of different uh, fields of science that are relevant to depression, things that a lot of psychologists don't really pay much attention to. So there's a, a field called cognitive neuroscience and a related field called affective neuroscience that has a great deal of insight into the relationship between how we think about things and what the mood consequences are and what the behavioral consequences are. And if there is such a thing as a typical depressed person, they have what is called a global cognitive style. In plain language, they tend to think in over general terms. So when a bad thing happens, they don't just say a bad thing happens. They say life is so unfair. You know, why is this always happening to me? And they take these episodes in life and they make them much, much bigger, which of course has a much bigger mood impact. But what you're referring to that's related to that is what are called discriminations. And when you're a global thinker, when you're an overgeneral thinker, you're not going to make discriminations very well. So it's how people end up making mistakes that hurt them. So for example, if, if you can't tell the difference between something that affects you personally versus something that is actually personal, then you'll be taking things personally all the time that really aren't personal. So for example, the company that you work for goes bankrupt and they have to close their doors and a hundred people lose their jobs. Well, that obviously affects you personally, but it isn't personal. 
the, the company didn't go bankrupt because they wanted to get rid of you. Uh, it, it, it affects you personally, but it isn't personal. And that's just one simple example of hundreds of distinctions or discriminations that somebody would need to be able to make well if they're going to live well. How do you know what's in your control and what isn't in your control? How do you know what you're responsible for and what you're not responsible for? How do you know what you should hold on to and what you should let go of? Uh, how do you know what you should self-disclose and what you should keep to yourself? And when people don't know how to make these distinctions, when they just react, when they just leak out whatever they're thinking or feeling, they're going to make mistakes. And when those mistakes come back at them and hurt them, that's when they end up talking to a psychologist about how painful their life is and how badly things are going. So learning how to use information and how to make better decisions and how to think more clearly and how to make these, these kinds of important distinctions in life becomes a pretty significant factor in overcoming depression. And I think that after this, then it makes sense in what skills do I need? Because now I've distinguished what it is that I need um, and what's missing in my skills that I have not learned maybe from childhood or just the opportunity has not been there for me to learn it or I haven't had the role model. And then I can go to some of the to-do lists that you have in your book also as, as you go in and say, well, these things might be what you said reflective where I can look at how, what type of a thought process I have and I can distinguish. Now, these are the exercises that helps me do things right. you need to learn. Exactly right. You know, the, the socialization part of it, the way that you grow up, if, if, if you grow up with, you know, everybody around you encouraging you to be brilliant academically and all that matters are your grades and work, 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 you know, you're going to be the person that has a hard time relaxing and knowing how to play. Or likewise, if your family raises you where, you know, it's, it's all about your athletic performance, sports, 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 win the big game, win the big game then you're never going to learn how to be a good loser. And you're never going to learn that there are other things in life besides sports that matter. Uh, and, and that's the point is we, we grow up with our focus over here. And it means then that we really don't learn how to do the things very well over here. And it's the things that we know that aren't so. And it's the things that we don't know that really come back to, to haunt us. I know personally, after taking your courses and, um, uh, and you know, when I took your course, I was a seasoned therapist anyway, but after taking your courses, I remember personally, my mind was so much quieter because of the ability to distinguish and put it into the right place immediately. Like most of the rumination was gone immediately. And you come to this piece where like, oh, that's what it is. So it's a gift for everyone who's watching us or hearing us that going through uh, this uh, technique is, is a gift to all of you. So this I appreciate, is- also I appreciate you sharing that, you know, and, and you just introduced the term rumination and I'm not sure whether viewers know what that even means, but you know, let's use that as an example. What, what rumination means is spinning around the same thoughts over and over and over again and analyzing and analyzing and analyzing and it generates what many people call the analysis paralysis, that you keep, you keep assuming that if you think harder and analyze more, you'll get it all figured out. And the point is that rumination drives a lot of anxiety. It drives a lot of depression. When you ruminate about things and try and analyze things that no amount of analysis is going to answer for you. You know, why is this happening to me? What does it mean? Well, how do you how do you answer some of these questions? You know, people who ask huge questions, you know, the, the young mother who's in my office who's crying her eyes out because her two-year-old died of leukemia. And there she is, you know, asking, why did this happen? Why did this happen? And, you know, how, how do you answer a question like that? No amount of analyzing it is going to give you a satisfactory answer. You know, you're, you're never going to be feel okay about the fact that your two-year-old died of leukemia. And you can find meaning in it, and you can find perspective in it, 
but not by asking why, why, why and, and ruminating about it. So it, it really helps to be able to, again, make the distinctions. Am I even asking a question that can be answered? Is this an answerable question where more analysis and more research is going to make a difference? You know, you need to buy a car and you want to know which car has the best gas mileage? That we can answer. You know, what? Why God made people to be cruel? Good luck trying to answer that. Right. You know, so yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I also learned, which is um, uh, shift the questions if you want the answer, because obviously some of these uh, questions don't have uh, any answers, and you're just going to waste your time. So right. speaking about also the skills that you uh, you teach. Um, and uh, tools that you offer beside the breaking uh, the patterns of depression, which is an audio book. Everyone, if you like the actual book, it's out there, but now audio book is out there too. But you also have created this app mindset, which is wonderful. There's a lot of um, hypnosis, hypnotic messages and uh, support in how people not only can let go of or and release themselves from the depression, but also a lot of tools in there. Can you share a little bit about the app? Sure. Well, I was contacted by these two Australian technology experts who were setting up a app called Mindset. People can go to mindsethealth.com to, to see it. Uh, but th they had envisioned a mental health app, something that would support people in their personal growth and help them cope with anxiety and depression and feel good and all of those kinds of things. And I've got to be honest with you, I, I am a technological dinosaur. And the, the idea of a phone app being used to provide mental health support just would have never occurred to me in a million years. And in fact, the first time they asked me about it, I said no. And then as uh, the research started to grow because of how popular apps became, the researchers got into the question to ask, are people using these apps? And then when they do use them, do they actually work? And the research has been incredibly supportive of the fact that people do use these things and they do report great gains from them. And so the folks at Mindset started establishing their programs and keeping pretty serious data about how often people were using these programs, which programs they were using, how many times they would listen to particular sessions, what gains that they would report making. And I was really shocked in the best of ways that people were listening to these things and reporting great benefits from them. These are dozens and dozens of hypnosis sessions that each target different kinds of patterns in people. How do you learn what's in your control and what isn't? How do you relax in order to man better manage your anxiety? How do you make sure you're thinking more clearly? How do you build the mindset of whatever skill set you're trying to learn? And so it's a subscription service. People pay a small fee. I think right now it's either $11 a month or $70 a year to have unlimited access to all of these programs. And uh, I am really proud now of the fact that I got pulled into doing this reluctantly, admittedly, but that's kind of where I'm at is getting dragged screaming and kicking into the 21st century. And uh, the reality is that people are using the apps by the thousands and they're benefiting from them. And I'm really pleased to be associated with it and to be a content provider. So I, I have been gradually expanding the bank of sessions available. Uh, they're bringing in other experts as well to, to deal with issues like irritable bowel syndrome and pain and headaches and postmenopausal hot flashes and the range of offerings by experts, internationally known experts, is increasing and it's really become a, a very significant thing. And uh, uh, the fact that it's readily available 24 hours a day, seven days a week is especially important during the pandemic. Uh, when people can't see their therapist face to face. Therapists, providers are recommending it to their clients because it's support in between sessions. 
so that you know when you're, you're going to see this person again next week but between now and next week they can listen to a bunch of sessions and keep their progress going so it's really been a good thing i appreciate that you letting me uh, have a chance to talk about it because it yeah last time i heard it from you i went on it and i really enjoyed it and i have been um actually prescribing prescribing it to my uh clients uh, Thank this you. Way that you were talking about that. because it's really really useful um, and I, I hope that everyone who's listening or watching us definitely uh, check out Mindset app. Um, I hope to see you. I know you are a, a presenter at the Evolution of Psychotherapy. And this time is going to be online. So for all of the psychologists and mental health specialists who are listening to us or watching us, please uh, check in Evolution of Psychotherapy, which all the masters of psychotherapy are there. And uh, you're presenting also. You, you present almost every year. So it's exciting to have you there again. I will be pleased to be there. It is an incredible meeting. And because it is virtual this year, instead of people having to choose out of eight things going on at a time that are all great, how do you choose which one to go to? All of them will be recorded. And when people register for it, they'll have access to all of the recordings, which is really a wonderful thing. It is. It is an exciting. Yeah. Thank you so much. I know you've been so busy and you, uh, give, uh, give me the chance to be with me and everyone who's with us. So thank as, you again. And thank as, you for all as, the years and things I've ever learned from you. Thank you. And things I've learned from you as well. You're quite the author yourself. So I appreciate that and, and, and teacher as well. So thank you and uh, take care of yourself. Stay safe, stay healthy. Absolutely. Don't go anywhere, everyone. We'll be right back. Have you ever wished you could just wake up one day, reach across your nightstand, and hit the life reset button? Let's face it, the struggles and frustrations of everyday life leave millions of women and men around the globe yearning for a new way. And the new way is right here in Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want by Dr. Fujan Zane. You can get it now at fujan.com or amazon.com. Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want. You deserve it. Well, hello and welcome again. I'm Dr. Fujan Zain, and I'm excited to have Howard Ross with us. Howard Ross is a lifelong social, in, social justice advocate and a principal in Udarta Consulting. Ross is considered one of the world's seminal thought leaders on identifying and addressing unconscious bias. He has authored several books, including Our Search for Belonging and Reinventing Diversity. Today, though, we will be discussing um, his latest edition of his book, uh, best-selling book that came out, Everyday Bias, Identifying and Navigating Unconscious Judgments in Our Daily Lives, describing how to bridge the divide in our increasingly polarized society. Welcome to the show. Hi, it's nice to be with you. How relevant and how important these issues are. So thank you so much for being um, on the show on this day. Um, every day, I think that when we are um, looking at media, uh, this essence of every one of us having uh, really strong opinions about things that show up. And um, there's a lot of, um, th the opinions obviously sway in different ways. And also as a therapist for about 30 years, I've been blessed, Howard, in having people from all walks of life, uh, all different cultures, uh, all different races, and, um, seeing all the difference that is among us and yet the way that we are with each other there's this keen level that we are um our opinions are sort of slanted to a particular way and it shows up from our culture in uh, such a profound way that it's almost like innate part of us and even when i've had to talk to clients and say do you hear yourself saying this it is so unconscious that they're like, mm, no, that's not what I'm saying. And then as you open it up for people, they can see it and the how biased we think. And then there's still a, maybe a sense of denial. And I know the first thing you started in your book 
was conversing about conscious versus unconscious biases. Can you share a bit with us? Sure, of course. Um, and and just you know, before I jump into that, I, I couldn't agree more with what you're saying about where we are in our culture right now. I think that um, we you know we tend to think that we're rational as human beings, but we're actually more rationalizing than we are rational. And um, you know, in a normal sense, you would think that what rational people would do would be to gather information and form our point of view based on the information we gather. You know, scientific method, right? You know, so we do that. But we know, and we can see right now in our culture that what people do instead is they have a point of view and then gather the information that serves that point of view and ignore that which doesn't. So um, the reason we named the book "Everyday Bias" was it, it, because there's it's hard to define where the line occurs between conscious and unconscious. You know, we know that certain things are extremely conscious. People are very, very aware that they have biases against a certain kind of a person or um, or it doesn't even have to be just a person. It could be anything in life, as you know. Um, and then we know that there are times when people are deeply unconscious and have no idea that they're harboring resistance. And this can occur of course, in personal relationships as well as group dynamics. But that area in between, you know, is challenging because, you know, there are some people, for example, um, uh, one of the people who I, who I quoted, one of the neuroscientists in the book, who says that all bias at its heart is, is unconscious bias. Because if, if we look, for example, let's say at homophobia, at bias against LGBTQ people, we would say there are a lot of people who are very conscious that they don't feel comfortable with LGBTQ, LGBTQ people. But where that came from was implanted at an unconscious level when they were very young. So subtle things that they heard or, or were told, things that they heard from their parents, from their religious institution that they were a part of, what they saw on television, teasing on the schoolyard, you know, any of these things that over time becomes just an accepted reality. Those people aren't my kind of people. Those aren't people I'm comfortable with. But all the things that led to that could be very unconscious. So it's so it, I, I try to avoid, the reason we named it Everyday Bias was because, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna, you know, you know, count the angels on the head of a pin and figure out, you know, is this completely conscious or unconscious? But we do need to know that it's operating in us all the time. Um, I remember a couple of uh, conversations that I've had, which um, I've been very blessed uh, to be shown my ignorance uh, by my clients. So, and I'm saying that I'm blessed because um, yes. sometimes we do need that, you know, that um, mirror to show us where are we? And uh, one aspect of it was with, uh, we went to a group, uh, with a group who m mostly, I can see it, say that they were African-American women. And then the rest of us, we all went to India. And there was this conversation that we were having about how um, we went to this hospital and came back. And one of the African-American um, women or friends who were there, she said, did you know they were looking at me, her? Um, and because I was African American. And I said, oh, that's interesting. I thought they were looking at me too uh, because um, I was different. You know, I, I had a blonde hair, you know, kind of like uh, hazel green eyes. And we all kind of coming together, different, uh, different races together as a group. So it was interesting that I thought it as that, that we're just different. And as we got into conversation, I really got that. I was not aware of her way of feeling and thinking about how systematic race is, is always there. And she looks at the world from that angle, which I never did. And another episode was I had a, a lady who came to see me and as she was talking about her relationships, um, I kept saying, you know, and um, how were you with him? And she looked at me and said, it's interesting. I've been talking to you for 20 minutes and it didn't even dawn on you that I might be lesbian and that it might, I might be talking about a she versus a he. And I'm like, you're right. It just wasn't even part of the natural because usually when I have clients who are gay or lesbians, they come in with that information. You know, they come right. in and say that I am gay or lesbian. So I come in, but since you didn't say it, I was under just came in with the assumption. And as I say, it's like, it's so, I'm so blessed that suddenly this show up for me to, to see how I'm boxed in thinking a particular way. And that area just doesn't even come up for me. You talk well, about, you know, constructive, I'll, 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 just to ask you this and please, then give you course, the ball. Of course. You also yeah. talk about constructive bias versus destructive bias. Can you also share about that? 
Of course, of course. But I just have to share a funny story with you that, that really captures what you were talking about that just a moment ago about this woman's sexual orientation. You know, a number of years ago, we had a um, we had a birthday party for my wife. I think it was it was a special birthday. It was her 50th birthday party. And um, and uh, so her family was in, of course, including her mother and her, her stepmother in law. Her father had remarried. And um, we had the party on the Saturday night. And, and on Sunday morning, the family's sitting around and her stepmother says, um, says, you know, um, last night I met I met um, this this lovely woman and she was telling me that she's having a um, she's having a baby with her partner that her partner is pregnant and they're having a baby and she said I've never I've never heard of somebody having a baby with their business partner before <laughs> and, and Leslie my wife said they're not business partners they're lesbians and and the reaction was oh I've never met one and we said not that you know of I mean we can be incredibly blind and and this is the way the mind works you know we create these sort of um a schema that we have, these frames of looking at things that have a see certain things and not others. So your friend that you described, the African-American friend that you described, has developed a very finely honed schema um, to look for systemic racism when she sees it because her survival depends on that. You know, just like I have four sons and I've never sat down with any of them when they got there. The youngest is 26 now. Never had to sit down with any of them when they got their driver's license and prepare them for how to keep alive if a police officer stopped them. But every black family I know has that conversation with their teenagers. So so the, this really, it's important for us to understand this, that, that we don't always see what's in front of us because our schema are different. Now, getting back to what you were talking about, about the constructive and, and destructive bias, um, it's important for people to realize that bias can sometimes work in the for, to the advantage of people. So, um, you know, the example I give often is, let's say you have two people coming in for an interview for a job. Somebody comes in in the morning, and uh, let's say you're the person I'm interviewing in the morning, um, and uh, I ask, you know, you come in and I ask you the first question of the interview, but, but I'm coming from a particular place because I had a positive reaction to you. Maybe, you know, in 10 seconds it can happen. And, and I'm sure everybody listening to us has had that happen. You meet somebody, something about this person I like, you know, sometimes it doesn't even merge to a thought. It's more of a feeling. Maybe you remind me of a girl who I dated in eighth grade or somebody had a crush on when I was in high school or a cousin who I loved dearly. And something about your eyebrows reminded me of her or, you know, your smile or who knows what it is. But I ask you the first question of the interview and you hem and haw a little bit and you're a little nervous. And without even thinking about it, coming from that place of positive positive energy, I say, oh, listen, I know you're nervous. Take a breath. Let me ask the question again. Because part of me wants you to be successful because of that positive inclination. Now, six hours later, somebody else comes in. And let's say it's not even a negative bias. It might just be neutral. And I ask them they the first question, and they hem and haw. And this time, I just sit there with my arms crossed and maybe even make that quick glance at my watch that they're not supposed to see. And now they're sweating bullets. And based on that five-second interaction, the interviews go to completely different directions. And so in that case, it was the positive bias that actually created the sense of unfairness because it may be that the second person had every bit as much confidence, capability, resume, and everything else. It just they didn't trigger that, oh, there's something about you that I like to the instant. So it can, it can both, both ways, positive biases that can benefit people, positive biases sometimes that can help us make choices towards things that are good for us, but also positive biases that can, can eliminate somebody unfairly, and negative biases which can do the same. Sometimes a negative bias towards particular groups can be very beneficial to us because it keeps us safe. We spot something in the distance that's dangerous and we act quickly, but often, as we know, negative biases can lead to tragedy. You also share this uh, concept, which I really liked. You said this tendency to determine quickly it's us and them is a, found, a foundational to our survival, but knowing whether they are one of us, it keeps us safe. And then mm -hmm. uh, you kind of like share about, or this question comes up, but, but who is us? You know, how do we define the us? Where is that kind of a um, experience of belongingness that comes in, um, in into calling, calling us versus them? And we can constantly yeah. see that even within the same group sometimes there is this this uh, kind of um, shift between even it could be you know all white people but then they have a shift right now because of a different kind of a political stance then it becomes us versus them um yeah. can you share about that 
Sure, of course. Yeah, I think that it's, and this is a really important um, thing for us to understand in the context of our, our current political system, um, because I think that's what we're really seeing play out a lot in the current political system and this need to belong, which which is really what my, my book, Our Search for Belonging, is all about if people are interested, because we go into that with great depth, is that what we know is that from an evolutionary standpoint, um, our survival has been based on quickly being able to identify, you know, who's the safe group and who's the not group, safe group, you know, who's the group that I belong to and who's the group that I may be counter to. So you can imagine people living in caves and jungles, for example, and looking and seeing a group of people around a waterhole in a tribal society, you had to be very clear it was us before you go into that, to that waterhole, because if you didn't, you died, likely, so, or you got captured or, or something. So, so as a result of that, we've learned very quickly to make this, this us versus them association, and as you said, it's at multiple levels. So between you and me, it's me or you. Um, then we raise it up and maybe it's we or they, and then it becomes us and them at a broader level, you know. Um, but if we look right now politically, we can see how it plays out as an example. It used to be in our culture that Democrat and Republican were not tribal in the sense that they are now. It might be that if you are a Democrat and I was a Republican, that we might agree on civil rights but disagree on foreign policy, but agree on economic policy, but disagree on gun rights, for example. And, and we would, on a position by position basis, we would team up. But we saw that, of course, in our legislature. We saw the way, you know, coalitions would get formed. Famously, people like, you know, um, John McCain and Joe Biden, who worked together on numerous kinds of things coming from different sides of the aisle as an example of that. But now what's happened is those political identifications have shifted, and it's now become a them versus us. It's now you know, I like to say we've gone from a bell curve where most people are in the middle and people are on the stream to a dumbbell curve where everybody's on the ends and nobody's in the middle. And so you're now not just somebody who disagrees with me in policy, you're one of them. Mm -hmm. And if you're one of them, how can I even associate with you? How can my neighbor across the street who, who has a different political affiliation for, than I do, we've maintained our friendship, but in a lot of cases, people have, have are, are, um, separating from family members, even um, because because this divide because it's now become tribal and and the cost of belonging to my group becomes diminishing the other group. So for for example, for our search for belonging, I went out and interviewed over a hundred people who voted for President Trump because I really wanted to understand. And I met a lot of really nice people, really good, decent people. Obviously, we disagree about some core issues, um, but uh, um, and and it was surprising to me and somewhat disappointing how many people on my side of the political aisle said to me, how can you waste your time with that, you know, talking to these people? And I've heard the same thing from people on the, on the, on the other side, on the more conservative side, about their efforts to talk to liberals and progressives. So, so what, what happens when we become in these tribes, it's not only threatening personally, but it's also threatening to others around us if we're consorting with the enemy, so to speak. Howard, the same way that uh, people who live with what is called at this point a white privilege, which may not necessarily understand or have seen the other side i don't think um and i and and i love united states and i people have not seen or lived in a dictatorial uh country to know what it means just to have one party and nothing else so it is so beautiful to have two and even more to have these options um to have the different ones versus you know fighting to have only one party keep winning and over and over and over and over again so um sometimes i you know the same thing you're saying that i obviously have a lot of friends and clients and people who are from the different parties and they you know um even some independent or kind of like refusing to be in one and uh, the same conversation, I was uh, talking to some of the political group and the first thing, um, you know, after they, they say, because they want to be elected, and I say, well, which party do you belong? Um, and they would say it like with a, with a question mark, like, is this the right answer? Right, exactly. And, you know, and I'm like, it's all a good answer. They're all the right answers. It's just, yes. you know, um, I'm not proposing that we should only have one party because of that, that would be you know, coming from right. different countries who have also gone through that, they, people don't want to see that. So it's, um, it's really uh, tough at this point. And um, Howard, how did we get here? Well, I think there, you know, that's obviously a, a complex question that we could talk about for days, uh, let alone not minutes, but I think that there are a number of factors. I think that uh, one, one factor um, that contributed to enorm contributes to it enormously is the media. 
um, and bifurcation of media. And I don't mean that to trash the media because I'm not somebody who feels media is evil or something like that. But I think what's happened is um, cable news has um, shifted us from its time. Like for example, when I grew up, and I'll be 70 in January, so you know it's a while ago. Um, when I grew up, um, we looked at ABC, NBC, and CBS, and then PBS when I was a little bit older. And um, we saw that basically the same news. It was all homogenized news. Um, it was considered to be unethical for a newscaster to have an opinion. Um, it's certainly not appropriate for a newscaster to have an opinion, except at the very end of the show, the, the, this person would come up and say, this is an editorial, you know, they would distinguish it. And so you had very little punditry and what you got was the news and then people would have their different interpretations of the news. Now, if you, if you watch MSNBC and I watch Fox, we don't only get a different interpretation of the news, we get different information. Um, you look at how certain things are covered, and I do watch multiple news stations, and you look at how these, these things are covered, and it's, and it's startling how different the information that's being shared is, plus about 70 to 80 percent of what's on is punditry of some kind. It's, it's biased news reporting. So, um, and, and then, of course, you have some news outlets, and this, that's just, of course, the, the on-air news. That doesn't even include social media, which is even worse in that regard, because people live in echo chambers of their own creation, just getting the articles from their friends, and many of the things that they're sent are not checked out. They're not, they're not um, legitimate. And now, of course, politicians who, who in the way to deal with a difficult news story is to declare it as fake news. And, and if all the person who's listening to is listening to that particular politician for their news, then, then you can give them a story that's got the most credibility of anything in the world. It's got all the facts, all the information. It's been vetted by 12 people. It comes right out of science. It doesn't matter because the person who I want to believe says it's fake, therefore I cancel it out. So, so rather than going to any, we have no common source of truth anymore. And I think what's begun to happen is people in, in, at high level of our political system have learned to manipulate that and to use that for their advantage um, in order to create a narrative that discounts the other side completely. You talk about selective attention, sometimes also known as inattentional blindness. Um, That's correct. Mm -hmm. process through which we selectively see some things but not others, which is mm -hmm. some of the conversation we were just also having, depending upon our point of focus or what we happen to be focusing on at a particular time. Um, so it, not only that, uh, not only that we do that, but now, as you shared, especially with the news and, and also I think social media, which keeps feeding us back whatever we believe, we tend to also think that the world thinks like us. So it keeps going back and thinking, oh, we're the majority thinking because you know, the social media keeps feeding back the same thing to us. So on a channel of TV, we're the one who chooses what type of uh, news we choose to listen to and whether we choose to listen to all of them to get different perspective or just choose to keep looking at one. But the other part of the social media keeps feeding the same thing over and over. And I've really sensed that every single person who's part of this social media conversation, they actually think that the majority are thinking just like them. It could be one or two out there, um, you yeah. know, it's as if like um, seven billion and a half people, all of them think like me. Maybe there's two or three of them which are the other side, which is not accurate. It's just that's you know we see it in in a particular way actually. But it's also even accentuated by the Pujan, by the fact that um, our we are living in more. Um, segregated, politically segregated enclaves than ever before. The Cook Political Report has done a study since 1992. They call it the Whole Foods Cracker Barrel Divide. And what they, what they identified was that people who live around Whole Foods markets tend to be more liberal because that's the communities that Whole Foods tends to be in. And then people who go to Cracker Barrel restaurants tend to be more conservative. And when they first started to, to study this back in 1992, the 1992 election between President Clinton and the first President Bush, um, what they found was the difference in these communities was about 20%, give or take. In other words, about 20% more Republican votes in the Cracker Barrel communities than in the Whole Foods communities and vice versa with the Democratic votes. And they followed it every election since. In the last election, that number was over 50% difference. That means that we are living in political areas now, most where most people live, where everybody around you likely agrees with you, or, or most everybody around you likely agrees with you. So that means the people you shop with, the people who you likely attend your religious ceremonies with, the children who go to school with your children, and therefore the parents you meet, um, you know, the social engagements, all of that stuff is, is you know, the same as me. And, um, and of course, you know, we add in, you know, 
radio and, and, you know, as we said before, print media and various different kinds of things. And, and it all gets reinforced, particularly dramatically. And, and you know, this, the, the selective attention aspect is a piece of this because, you know, you mentioned it when you talked again about your friend, your African-American friend who saw something that you didn't see. She was able to spot something in the same scene. We could demonstrate selective attention to our listeners now very, very quickly. Just at, I'll ask people for just five seconds to look around the room and see how many things they can count that are blue. And just every, if everybody takes like five or five or six seconds and does that. And I'm sure everybody has a number. Now close your eyes. Now, how many red things did you see? Mm-hmm. You know, now my guess is that 99% of the people listening have no idea how many red things they saw because they weren't looking for the red things. They were selectively looking for the blue things. Even though the red things were right in front of their face just as much as the blue things were. And so th- this, this is a big part of what we see. And, and of course, this shows up, shows up even at work. You know, who do we see as talented? Well, the person who we're inclined to see as talented. Um, and so, so this is impacting us all the time. Um, in your book, you also talk about power and privilege, uh, having two domain. Most people belonging to at least one group that affords them privilege. But despite mm-hmm. our power and privilege in some areas, we could be in the non-dominant uh, group also. So if everybody really looks at it, I think uh, they can find both sides of what areas they are privileged and what areas they aren't. Um, To conclude, um, you also talk about shifting to neutral. And um, I love the sentence you said, our minds can become liberated by our awareness of the automaticity. Uh, Then you you suggest paying attention, acknowledge your assumptions, understand your perspective, seek different perspective, and examine your options and make a decision. Share a little bit about all of those with us, please. Yeah, of course. Well, um, well, first of all, the pause is, is really important. Um, I think it was the, the brilliant uh, psychotherapist, Viktor Frankl, who said that um, the pause, the, the freedom is the pause between stimulus and response. You know, is that moment where we feel like we want to act and we stop for a moment and we say, is this the appropriate thing to do? And I think that that's one of the things we need to do. We know from a from a uh, neuro neurological standpoint that this allows our slow brain to kick in, the prefrontal cortex, the part of our brain that's more thoughtful and more deliberate. And, and it's one of the challenges that we have in everyday life, that life gets kind of shot at us point blank. But I'm glad you brought back the question of privilege because this has been, this is, you know, very contentious right now, um, this whole concept of white privilege. And, and, it's, and it's deeply, deeply misunderstood and often misused in terms of how it's applied. Um, white privilege is actually a network, a system that we're engaged in. We live in a country in the United States that for 400 years has created a narrative of racial difference. And that narrative of racial difference obviously has had white people be at the top and, and people of color at different levels in the bottom, usually African Americans at the bottom. And um, and that's get, gotten played out in all of our institutions and the numbers of people who've been president and Congress and Supreme Court and then laws. And we know 350 years of legal segregation, 250 years of legal slavery during that time, all of these kinds of things. And that's created a particular system that we all grow up in. And that is that the white man, for example, is a white skinned man, deep, I'm Jewish. And so I'm outside of the in group in terms of my religion. Um, I still have been raised to um, to play a role in that culture. That means that, and there are subtle things like how I assume people will listen to me, what I have a right to say, that, can I speak without people making it about my race or my gender? You know, all of these very subtle, do I have to teach my children how to be safe with the police officer? You know, all of these are privileges that I have, but it doesn't mean I'm a bad person. It doesn't mean that white people are bad for having white privilege. I mean, I, I wouldn't be teaching white privilege. I'm a white guy with four white sons and, and grandchildren, you know? It would be silly for me to be doing that. But it's just to say, can we be aware of that? And of course, for people of color, um, and sometimes people from other cultures, as you know, I'm sure you've experienced bias as an Iranian woman at times, and people make up stuff, and people who think that people who live in Tehran have camels and tents on sand in that city, even though we know it's an amazing city, right? Um, and so um, and so the same thing can happen. Now, it's like, who are you to be saying? You're not even an American, and it doesn't matter how long you've been here, it's still... I'm sure there are people who would say that or think that if they didn't say it. So it's so it's so important for us to understand that this concept of privilege and how we talk about privilege shouldn't be about good people and bad people. It should really be understanding just how this plays out in our interactions. Absolutely. In one minute, is there anything we haven't shared that we really need to share and you want the audience to know? 
Yeah, I think that there's one thing that's really important for us to know that even in how we're dealing with COVID, this issue of bias plays out because, you know, it's been now labeled a political dynamic, which is insane when we think about it, that something like a pandemic should be political, but we know that it is. And so if you're on one side, the president has tended to play it, you think that wearing a mask is a political statement, I'm going to keep my mask off if you're on the other side. And and so it just adds to it. So, so the last thing I would leave with people is to, this is a really important place for us to stop and pause and say, what's really in my health, the health, best interest of my personal health, my family's health, and my community's health? And let's put all that politics aside and just take care of each other. Thank you so much. Um, everyone, everyday bias, identifying and navigating unconscious judgments in our daily lives. Howard Ross, and please find him on howardjross.com. Thank you so much, Howard, for being on the show. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you. And for all of you who are with us, uh, create an amazing life for yourself and everyone around you. And until next week, take care. Bye-bye. From ABC News. I'm Daria Aldinger. There are still a lot of questions about a New York Times report regarding President Trump's taxes and very few answers. I was Senator Chuck Grassley, one of the few Republicans.